Um, uh, welcome everyone to this edition of Print Speak. Uh, my name is Rebecca Travis, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Curator and Collections Manager here at Open Studio. We're really excited to be joined today by artist Kit McNeil for their talk, A Print Speak Designed to Exist in Passing Time. Um, before we begin, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement for where Open Studio is situated. Open Studio acknowledges that it is situated on the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Anishinaabe, the Huron Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. They are the original owners and custodians of the land on which we continue to create and exist. If you're new to Open Studio, um, a bit of information about us. Uh, we're an artist-run printmaking center. Um, we offer accessible, inclusive, and affordable printmaking facilities, programs, and services for artists and the public across Canada and abroad. We support artists in creating and exhibiting contemporary print in an open-minded, safe, and collaborative environment. And our vision is to shape the exploration of print as essential, dynamic, and relevant to contemporary culture and creative thought. Um, the print speak series is a virtual education series that focuses on the incredible artists whose work pushes the boundaries of print media. These talks will take you on a journey with each artist to learn about their passion for creating. And just a couple of Zoom protocols. Um, I mentioned this right at the beginning, but if you don't want to be on camera, now's a good time to turn it off as the talk is recorded. Um, please put yourself on mute for the talk. Um, and this will be an approximately 30 minute artist talk uh, with a 15 minute Q&A. You can put your questions in the chat um, or we can use the raised hand emoji and we'll get to your questions at that time. Um, so, sorry about that. I'm delighted to introduce Kit McNeil. Um, Kit, they, them, is a genderqueer American Canadian artist, educator, curator and writer living in Toronto. They earned their BA in studio art from the College of Charleston and their MFA in studio art from the University of Buffalo. Their work has been exhibited in France, China, Canada, and throughout numerous institutions in the US. McNeil currently works as the college printer at Massey College in the University of Toronto. Um, for their print speak session, a print speak designed to exist in passing time, they will discuss their artistic practice at the intersection of print and performance. McNeil will trace how these mediums have developed in their work as a means of exploring themes of trauma, illness, and gender identity. Integrating the foundational concepts of print alongside embodied mark making, performance, and video based. And how all these diverse media intersect, and their aims to push the definition of print into further dimensions. Over to you, Kit. Thank you. Um going to share my screen for a moment. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, seeing some names of some folks that I haven't seen in a while. So it's really nice uh, you guys are here with us today. Um, a quick, uh, let me see if I can, hold on a second, minimize this real quick. Um, a quick uh, couple of just comments. Um, one is today is uh, June 1st, which is the first day of Pride Month. Um, which for many of us queers, uh, you know, is a, is a month of celebration. Um, but I do want to kind of mark this as a reminder for those of us, those in the audience um, who are kind of more on the cis hetero side of things that um, there are a number of anti-trans, anti-queer, um, um, anti-gay uh, bills that have been making their way across North America, um, especially in the US. And we can start to see those creeping into Canada as well. Um, and just as a reminder that though this is a month of celebration that, um, you know, our, the fight is not over. Um, the other note is that I do just want to provide a bit of a content warning. Um, and that is uh, for the talk, I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, depression and PTSD and um, with some of that, you know, uh, the trauma um, and my own personal PTSD being um, experiences of domestic violence. Um, and so there are gonna be some mentions of domestic violence in the talk about um, a, a third or midway through. Um, and uh, just in complete solidarity, if you need to step away, by all means, please do so. Um, I'm, not, I'm going to try not to be very explicit about it. Um, and I will kind of flag when I'm gonna talk about it. Um, so 
uh, a print speak designed to exist in passing time. Um, obviously, print speak is the name of this series, um, but the title also refers to a work by Robert Rauschenberg, um, American interdisciplinary artist, uh, printmaker, painter, assemblage ish, <laughs> um, and this work that uh, he created, which is called This is the First Half of a Print Design to Exist in Passing Time. Um, and it's actually a small booklet that we can see on the left hand side. It has tracing paper on the cover with the title of the piece written on that tracing paper. And then through the booklet, we can actually see um, a series of woodblock prints. And those woodblock prints start as just a black block that we can see. Um, we can kind of see that grid start in the, the top uh, right hand side of the screen. Um, it starts as a black block. And then as it progresses through the booklet, um, more and more lines are carved into this block. Um, and the idea being is that we're looking at the same block of wood and we're looking at the changes that Rauschenberg is making to this block by carving one line, then two, and then three, and so on and so forth. Um, and I, I bring this particular work up because um, this was a piece that was brought to my attention when I was in grad school by one of my, uh, my mentors. And um, I was making work that was very similar in this, in this theme. And it, it was this sort of trajectory of trying to take a two-dimensional print and have it exist within time, um, that sort of, me, sort of led me on this trajectory of thinking about performance art. Um, and so it was a bittersweet moment of coming across this work when uh, you know, I realized like one, that the work that I was making was by no means original, but it was also kind of amazing that I was doing work that you know I hadn't been familiar with before, but like Robert Rauschenberg was thinking in the same uh, vein. So that was kind of a nice little like, ah, shocks that pat myself on the back at the same moment. Um, so I'm gonna kind of move through some of my work chronologically um, and kind of try to track my um, my line of thought as to where I kind of started and, and where, where I am now with um, thinking about performance and printmaking. Um, and I would say a lot of it started with this particular work, which is called Untitled the Void. It's in Talio on a uh, zircal copper plate paper. The panel that we're looking at right now is 10 feet wide by seven feet tall. And it's a series of aqua tint prints that are printed on 18 by 24 inch paper. Um, and it, um, it, so these aqua tints all were printed from the, the same plate. And so what I did was I, I took a 18 by 24 inch um, copper plate, aqua tinted it. Um, so it was completely black, which is that middle center square. Um, took the plate down and started to reduce the aqua tint, print it again. Um, add the aqua tint back in, reduce it, and continue this process. This entire process, um, we're looking at 25 prints here, but I pulled somewhere in the number of about 100 to 125 to get to this sort of final image that we see. Um, and it took me roughly eight months. Um, <clears throat> and so here we can see um, a stack of some of those prints. The actual stack is actually like several inches thick. It's a, it was a lot of paper and it's very heavy. Um, this is the the work installed where I took you know 25 of the good ones are on the right hand side and then I took 25 of the bad ones that weren't quite up to snuff and I kind of made sort of a mirror image with them and so this work for me um when I was making this work I was really thinking through you know I was working with this 18 by 24 inch plate that I was reworking over and over and over again and for me, I was thinking about the print matrix or um, that copper plate as being a vehicle or a receptacle for, for memory. Um, and this particular work I developed when I was 25 years old, and that was a bit of a milestone for me because I was thinking I was hit a quarter of a century and it was 25 years that I'd been living with um, depression and PTSD. And um, this was sort of a way of me to I, you know, I was like kind of physically working through that sort of depressing milestone. Um, and also, you know, trying to find a way to kind of visually represent that with <laughs> what ends up being, you know, this sort of giant black hole, which is sort of how I, I the feeling that I kind of had about my life. Um, but a lot of the, for me, a lot of the significance of this piece had to do with the process and had to do with this plate that was being worked over and over and over again and the memories that that particular plate was holding and um, the physical full body process that that was, went into making this work. And when I was discussing this work with um, people when it was installed, I found that you know that meaning was really lost on a lot of people who were not printmakers. And 
people had no idea what an aqua tint was or no idea what a printmaking matrix was or no idea how the copper plate ended up being these prints on the wall. And I would find myself trying to explain the work. And I was like, this is like a, a 20 minute lecture to try to just in trying to explain how this particular process was made. Um, and that sort of, you know, started to lead me to think about ways that I could more overtly involve the body in my work if I wanted to make work that, you know, was pertaining to to memory and to trauma and to depression, finding ways to really take print and sort of activate it in a way that what I was doing to these plates was more readily accessible to the viewer, to the audience. Um, and so like many people who are <laughs> in their adult years and feeling a little stuck, I decided to go to grad school, um, which was, uh, you know, ended up being a really great decision on my part um, because I had the opportunity to work with some amazing uh, mentors and artists and um and researchers in visual studies uh, while I was at the University of Buffalo. Um, in particular, I was able to work with um, artist Millie Chen and um, uh, researcher um, Yasmina Tumbas, uh, who both introduced me to a number of performance artists um, and performance art movements, um, uh, including uh, Fluxus and including uh, Yoko Ono. Um, so Yoko Ono is really well known for this book, that she, in addition to many things, but artists know her really well for her performance pieces and this this particular book called Grapefruit, um, in which she writes out all these different performance scores. And it's a beautiful work um, if you read it as a piece of poetry, and it's also quite beautiful if you read these sort of instructions as um, actions that you can do with your body. And so my first sort of... Um, for it, foray into thinking about combining printmaking and performance was pretty literal in the sense that, you know, I was like, I'm going to make a print that is going to be a performance score that I can then um, perform. And so th that would be this print that we're looking at right now, um, which is the entire piece, this print and the performance is called Things to Do With Your Mouth. Um, it's in Talio uh, with a uh, dry point method on washi paper um, and the print itself is roughly about nine by six inches. Um, and so the, the handwriting on it reads tear and eat this half with um, this half on the right hand side of a, of a dotted line that is kind of intended to be torn. And so creating this performance score for myself, I then decided to um, go ahead and perform this piece. Um, and I'm not gonna play this entire video for you, but um, it's about two minutes long. And all of my videos are available on my website um, if, you, if you'd like to watch them later. Um, so I recently um, wrote a bit about this piece for uh, the RISD Museum's journal manual, and that article is available online as well. Um, but in that piece, I talk about how this particular performance for me is kind of exists at the intersection of thinking about both performing gender um, and performing mental health. And I was thinking through several things including like instructions that are given with a set of prescriptions as treatment for PTSD um, and also thinking about how mental health is so kind of tightly integrated with um, you know with gender and how we're perceived with you know certain mental health diagnoses being prescribed or ascribed rather um, more closely to particular genders over others. Um, and so this was sort of, you know, at a time when I was really kind of starting to question my gender identity and also starting to really question, um, you know, my own sort of relationship with mental health and, you know, kind of moving past this sort of 25 year milestone and trying to find ways to um, kind of be on better terms with myself. Um, at around the same time, I so, you know, I was kind of engaging with performance through actually creating a score that I then activated and that score being a physical print itself and obviously sort of eating the paper <laughs> um, and that sort of being like print and performance. Um, I was also thinking through what I would consider performative mark making. Um, and so I started doing some tests with um, trying to get an impression of my body onto an intaglio or an etching plate. And so 
these three prints that we see here are um, several examples of some of those tests. Um, they're, um, uh, they were all rolled up with um, a soft ground and then I then uh, pressed my body into the soft ground and then etched it. And so wherever we see those marks is where you would see my body had pressed in. So if you, there, it might be a little hard to see on your screens, but there's um, bits of hair, there's fingernails, um, there's pores. Um, and wrinkle lines um, and uh, other things like that um, that kind of come through on the plate. And I was really excited about these 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 um, these tests uh, printing so well. Um, and so I decided to uh, pursue them by making them much larger as a way to try to capture the full body. Um, so I'm going to kind of uh, go ahead and flag. So this is the that content warning that I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to kind of get into some of that um, now. So there will be some discussion of domestic violence here in a moment. Um, so I made a series of three of these. So this one that we're seeing here is four feet by six feet. Um, this is eight feet by three feet um, and four feet by six feet again. Um, so these particular prints, um, you know, I was working with these really large copper plates, pressing my body into the soft ground as a way to get these, these impressions. Um, and at the same time, I was also doing a lot of research into traumatic memory and thinking about how trauma really impacts our memory and how it can for some people it can distort and you know severe traumatic events can cause um, you to completely forget things um, and in others it can do the exact opposite where um, a memory is perfectly and um, preserved in the mind as almost like a movie um, that is replayed over and over and over again um, and and for me that 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 Second option was more the case where um, growing up in a household with a lot of domestic violence, um, being in several uh, relationships in my 20s um, that experienced domestic violence, um, you know, I had these moments where um, my memories of most of my childhood are just sort of littered with domestic violence. There are some kind of happy moments in there, but a lot of it was kind of watching these movies over and over again in my head and not being able to um, really kind of move past it. And so I wanted to try to find a way to think about um, memory, you know, as something, you know, it, you know, it's kind of static in the sense that it's sort of stuck and I can't kind of get past these memories uh, or at the time I couldn't get past these memories, but also as something that was kind of actively moving and actively impacting and um, being present within my body. Um, and so for me, these particular prints, um, I, I personally view them as these thinking as a body being sort of thrown into the ground or being thrown into a wall. And there are these sort of moments that are kind of in medias race where it's a body that's in the middle of being in action. Um, and then you're kind of capturing almost like a freeze frame of that particular action in place. Um, <clears throat> um, and this, this work also sort of led me again to kind of thinking about ways that I could make the body again even even more overtly explicit um, within my performance work um, and led to this the video piece I'm about to show you. Um, I also sort of reinterpreted these prints as another piece um, where I kind of more abstracted the body forms and that would be here. Um, so the that 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 process led me into this this particular piece um, which is called vicious cycle. And so this is a video piece. I'll play you a short um, clip of this. On the left-hand side, we have a, another copper plate that has been um, rolled up with a black ink. And on the right-hand side, it's a copper plate that is completely bare. And you'll kind of see that it has a very strong um, reflective surface. So uh, this video is right about in the middle of the performance. And so what I'm doing on the left here is I am using my hands and my forearms to wipe the ink off of the plate. Um, and on the right hand side, I was obviously punching that copper plate. And so this particular piece um, for me really explores the boundaries of personal identity as one that was marked by traumatic experience. Um, 
And it, it, I kind of see it as a way that by like allowing the viewer to watch an internal struggle made um, corporeal, the the work situates the viewer in in sort of the role of witness. And there's a, there's a lot more going on in that piece that I, I don't have the time to really unpack, but um, those those two those works the um, that kind of etching series and that that video performance really kind of went hand in hand for me. Um, here we're seeing those two plates after that performance um, happened. They were then printed, um, so we can see the plate that was punched on the left hand side, and um, the plate where I was wiping the ink off with my hands is is on the right hand side, um, and they're each. Um, uh, three feet by four feet. Um, and then shortly after this, um, I kind of continued, you know, thinking again about sort of performative mark making where there's a performance that's sort of happening to the plate. You're maybe not seeing the performance live, but you're seeing sort of the residue or the trace image of the performance um, pretty, pretty explicitly or overtly within the remainder of the plate. Um, and that led me to do these series of monotypes where I was working with um, uh, leftover makeup that I had, or um, not really leftover makeup, makeup that I had that I, I found that I never used because I don't particularly wear a lot of makeup. Um, and um, that, that is in part because, uh, you know, at this time I was really kind of questioning my gender identity and, and femininity and thinking about you know, my relationship with that and feeling like every time that I was wearing makeup, I sort of, it didn't feel quite right. And I felt like I sort of had to, in order to kind of perform being, you know, you know, feminine and, and sort of realizing that that was a shoe that was really not fitting me and that I was really trying to force myself into. Um, and so this, 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 these series of works um, were really me kind of working through that. And so, for these particular pieces, I took lipstick, eyeshadow, foundation, bronzer, um, makeup things that I probably don't even know the names of, but had different colors. And I um, mixed them with different printmaking binders. Um, and in this particular case, I coated them on my lips and I started uh, making out with the plate. Um, in this piece, I, I rolled those different um, makeup mediums onto the plate. And then um, in a similar fashion to that performance I just showed you, I used my hands and my forearms to wipe through the plate. And so these different layers of the makeup come through. It's a little hard to tell in the photograph, but in the center area um, that looks kind of light grayish, it's actually a bit of a light green um, that sort of uh, pings off of the, the pink of the lipstick. Um, this was another one where instead of working reductively, I, I kind of took the makeup onto my hands and I worked positively and sort of spread it onto the plate. Um, and again, with this piece as well. And so um, again, with this piece, I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of mixing my own inks with these with makeup. And then I'm using my body as a means to make these particular marks. So I'm using my hands, and my forearms. Um, my face, I was using my legs and my feet as well um, uh, to, 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 to make all of these prints. And for me, this was all about finding new ways to envision print and gender. Um, and for me, I think it kind of ultimately ended up being a way of sort of clearing the process around me to create a form and a future which could kind of express my particular, my, my identity. Um, I think, you know, for a really long time, I was sort of feeling like print was a little bit stagnant. And so the sort of combination of thinking about, you know, printmaking um, through performance um, was a way for me to sort of activate print for myself and also the sort of way to kind of like activate um, my own relationship with being queer. Um, uh, on to kind of more some more recent stuff. So if you if you if you know me for a while, uh, you know that some of that work is a little bit old. Um, over the past few years, we've obviously had uh, you know some some stuff going on globally, um, and I've also been dealing with some uh, some personal health issues and um, kind of working through trying to find ways to make my artistic practice and my performance practice more sustainable for me. So a lot of those things that I showed you were actually pretty hard on my body. The one I was physically punching a plate, <laughs> I did severely bruise my hands. I think I nearly broke my hand. Um, and uh, the other one where I was really embedding my body into the plate, um, you know, involved um, a lot of things that were, uh, a lot of chemicals that were unsafe for my body. Um, and so I'm, I'm really trying to do a bit of a 180 and starting to think through um, 
ways that I can produce art that is that's just healthier. Um, and so it's led me to do a number of collaborations. Um, and uh, I've been working with several different individuals and artists um, to kind of make new work. Um, one of the pieces I'm going to show you next isn't directly a, a, a print, but I, I do want to mention it because it's kind of helpful to think about it as <laughs> through the language of printmaking. Um, and so that is a video installation that I made with um, Zhang Yang, um, who, who goes by Bell, um, <clears throat> where we did uh, this, this video installation where it's one video on one side of on one wall and another video on the other wall. And they are constantly looping um, at, at, at sort of at random. The video here on the left-hand side is um, kind of more about Bell's narrative and the video on the right-hand side is my own personal narrative. And um, both of these videos um, are tracking our our personal, the, the title of the piece is cartography. And so we're actually sort of mapping our particular bodies and also with our bodies, we're mapping our, um, our, our families and um, is sort of looking through at intergenerational trauma and how, uh, you know, that can, um, uh, our, our familial stories can impact our bodies and sort of impact our, our existence today. Um, and one of the things that I found, uh, you know, really interesting about, about working with Bell was, you know, we um, were in an exchange program where we met um, briefly, we worked together briefly for about two weeks in China and then they, um, she came back to the US, we worked for about two weeks here. Um, and even though we'd never met before, even though we lived on completely opposite ends of the world with different languages and very different cultures, um, I found that we had these very similar kind of parallel stories that existed in our in our lifetimes and within our families. And um, one way of sort of viewing this piece is, you know, that we're having a conversation back and forth. But I like to think about it through the language of print where these are actually sort of mirrored images of each other um, with the mirror image always kind of being something that's constantly at play in printmaking. Um, so just a quick video so you can see what it looks like installed. Um, so that video in, in total to kind of watch both halves is um, roughly about 14 minutes. Um, and the whole thing is again up on um, my website if you do want to check that out. Um, another collaborative uh, work that I did recently um, is with Henry Gepfer, um, a US based artist. Um, we've been talking and sort of working and scheming um, for several years now uh, virtually and we had the chance to um, do some live performances last fall uh, for the Mid-America Print Council Conference in um, Kent, Ohio. Um, and it, it was a really fun time. This particular piece is um, mostly Henry's um, and that, you know, they largely wrote the, the script and the score for this piece. And I just kind of was able to help activate it um, by being the second party. Um, uh, it's it, it, it's funny. It's very silly. Um, it, there are some kind of undertones of seriousness in it, um, but it was just a blast to, to be able to work with them. And you know, both Henry and I, as queer printmakers, both working within performance, um, were able to sort of bounce a lot of ideas back and forth. And um, I'm really excited that we're going to be doing a, a collaborative exhibition um, coming up soon in uh, March in North Carolina. So. Um, be on the lookout for that. Um, this particular piece is called Soft Violence. Um, I don't have a video, but I will show you a few stills here in a moment. Um, but what we're doing right here is, um, again, kind of thinking about that mirror image. I am um, applying, I'm miming applying makeup to my face. And then Henry actually has the makeup that they are applying to their face. Um, and so the end result was Henry had a white face with um, two red circles in the shape of a target that were that were drawn on the center. Um, they then got on a pedestal of copy paper, proceeded to give a monologue, um, got stuck in the middle of that monologue, and then the only way to uh, <laughs> to stop the machine, so to speak, um, was me sort of hitting them with the pillowcase. And the the fall was intentional, um, but it is really fun to watch in slow motion. <laughs> um, uh, so that video again is available. I don't think I actually have this one on my website, but it's available on Henry's. Um, in here, you can see the uh, the pillowcase off to um, 
this side here. Um, another uh, collaborative piece, and this one is still in the works, um, but I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a, a sneak peek. And this is um, a collaborative work that I'm doing with my partner, uh, Drew McEwen, um, where we're thinking about um, a, a, a theme in disability studies called access into the sea, which is all about um, having access to somebody who kind of understands what your needs are in sort of an intimate setting. And um, I'm thinking about kind of going back to um, the thought of impression and going back to what it means for one body to sort of impress on the other. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of my practice is I'm trying to find ways to be more sustainable. And in dealing with my own sort of health issues, um, that what that looks like is sort of doing a 180 and thinking more about care and thinking more about um, collaboration and thinking about ways that um, the work can be healing as opposed to just sort of punching a copper plate. Um, so here's a short video. Um, we're gonna be working with this process um, on a larger scale, but this is sort of a test of um, some of the materials that we're gonna be working with and, and where it's gonna go from there. So these will be a series of small performances that are gonna be recorded in video. Um, and um, I do view them as, as prints. Uh, they're very ephemeral prints. So they're prints that maybe last a couple of seconds, but um, it's sort of when we think about archival materials when we think about prints you know some things last longer than others and so this just happens to be a, a print that um, only lasts a couple of seconds um last thing that i'll share i'm going to end on this um in addition to making work collaboratively henry gepther and i also have kind of an ongoing we're not really sure what to call it uh but curatorial community arts project <laughs> um where we are working with other artists who are um, at the intersection of print and performance and trying to create um, more platforms and more venues um, for us to kind of get our work out into the world and to be, um, you know, really kind of explicitly talking about print and performance art in conjunction to each other. And this kind of came out of a bit of a frustration that Henry and I both had where, um, you know, our work was maybe too print heavy for well, I will just was maybe too print heavy for, you know, other types of conceptual galleries. And then it was too performance and too video heavy for people who are really interested in print. Um, and so out of a frustration, out of many rejection letters, we've just kind of started to say, we're just gonna DIY this. Um, so we did on the right-hand side, we did um, one uh, uh, sort of incubator that I mentioned um, at the Mid-America Print Council um, last fall where we invited people to do a sort of like open mic to just kind of like, hey, if you've got something that's remotely print and performance related, like come on up and um, and uh, and perform. Um, and then for SGCI this, um, this past spring, we did um, a more curated selection of several artists who um, showed their work. Um, and our next sort of venture is we're wanting to do a free virtual seminar, and that will hopefully be coming up um, later this fall, um, where the ideas will meet several times. We'll be looking at some readings together, thinking about, um, you know, some of these kind of foundational concepts of printmaking and how they can work or coincide with performance art or vice versa. Um, and sort of um, help cultivate and kind of offer sort of a safe space for people to kind of try out what ends up being some pretty weird um, stuff. Uh, and then, you know, the idea is to eventually hopefully have um, potentially a, a, a group kind of exhibition or something out of that. So um, that is it for me today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Kit. That was a great talk. And it's always so interesting seeing print intersecting with other media and thinking about print kind of as a foundational idea of like impressing and what then when you kind of strip it back to that foundational idea, how many different ways you can start to think about it. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions. So um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can put your hand up uh, using the hand emoji or you can just type it into the chat and we'll read it out um, just to get things started. Um, I'm kind of curious when it comes to exhibiting your work, where you have the kind of physical ephemera from a performance and then you have the impermanent um, or like recording of the actual performance that you've you've done or a live performance, how those things all sort of sit together within exhibition and how you kind of 
think about like the after um the objects that come after the performance how that sits alongside like the actual kind of performative act yeah um it's interesting it can kind of change depending on the venue and <laughs> in the setting quite frequently mm -hmm. um and it's something that i do really think about a lot um I'm forgetting the name of the essay, but Peggy um, Phelan talks about this in, um, oh, the essay is uh, The Ontology of Performance, um, where she kind of explicitly kind of defines performance as being something that happens live in the moment. And um, there's this very ephemeral nature to performance where you either are there and you see it or you aren't. Otherwise, you're just seeing a photograph or you're seeing um, video documentation, or you're seeing um, this sort of kind of like performative residue, which in my case, they're sort of these prints, um, but they can also be other other material as well. So um, yeah, I, you know, she kind of has a pretty, sh I think um, it's been a hot minute since I read it, but my, my takeaway was she kind of had a, a sort of a strict sort of sense that, you know, performance really is this thing that kind of only exists in the moment. And I am kind of, I think, looking at it a bit more expansively where I'm really thinking about performative action and how that action is sort of recorded within the print. Um, and so, you know, so with that, I think my hope is that I'm trying to develop these works in a way that um, the action that's happening is a bit more readily accessible to the viewer um, than some other forms of printmaking, like the piece that I, I started off talking about um, as a way of trying to kind of communicate, you know, they can kind of start to imagine how the lipstick got onto the plate, so to speak. Um, but yeah, um, there are other performances. One I didn't talk about um, that we did that night in Ohio was um, I engaged with one of my letterpress pieces, which is um, a series of cough drop wrappers. Um, and that performance piece, um, Henry like fed me the cough drop wrappers and I ate the cough drop wrappers with these like really toxic motivational um, uh, phrases on them as a way of thinking about ingesting like toxic positivity in society around us. Um, and so the residue of that piece, so I didn't realize this, but a technical problem was that the paper I printed on was like a really long fiber Kozo and I actually couldn't chew through it. Like it was like trying to chew through gum that's like really, really stiff. Um, and so I had to actually spit it out. And so I have this sort of wad of chewed up prints and I'm like, do I, I mean, they're all dried off now, but I'm like, do I, I've saved them and I'm like, is this too gross to exhibit somewhere or do I, should I do something with these? Um, uh, so t TBD, to be determined as to what's going to happen with those. But, um, you know, I think, you know, there is, you know, trying to kind of, I'm really kind of constantly trying to concern myself with thinking about, um, you know, making sure that the action that is taken is sort of coming through in the, in the exhibition itself. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I suppose because so much of it involves interacting with your body, like you say, like sometimes there won't be um, a predetermined outcome that you can control. And then I suppose seeing what what that might lead to next is, is also an exciting kind of unfixed kind of way of working. Um, I actually just wanted to ask you a bit about collaboration as well. And uh, in terms of working like individually, sort of privately within a studio and then working collaboratively. Can you just talk about the different ways that you found that kind of helpful to work with other people? Yeah, I think um, it, it's, it. yeah, I, I guess <laughs> I, I feel like a good collaboration should never feel like a, a chore. Um, and I'm thinking back to like grade school and college and high school when I dreaded doing group projects. Uh, like completely dreaded doing group projects. I did not want to talk to other people. I just wanted to like do my own thing, mostly because I do everything last minute. And it was like, if we're writing an essay, it's not happening until like two hours before the class. So, um, but uh, I think what I found as an artist and not being forced to do a school assignment is that when I'm like, I think the collaborations are, are hopefully kind of coming a little bit more naturally. And I got really lucky when I was working with Belle, it was sort of an exchange program where um, you know she was really wanting to do work that involved the body, but hadn't been doing work that involved the body. And I was really interested in stories and narrative. And um, it became this natural back and forth where I feel like most of the time we were on 
the exchange together, we weren't really talking about work. We were sort of getting to know each other. And this work sort of came out of us talking and learning about each other and learning about different cultural um, customs surrounding mental health um, and physical health in, in China and in um, where I was living at the time, the United States. And, um, you know, it, it, it really did kind of fall into place quite naturally. And there was a lot of back and forth. And it's, it is fun when that happens and you're able to work collaboratively because you're able to have like an idea and you have someone to springboard it off of and you know they're as invested in the work as you are so you know sometimes when you're like hey what do you think of this idea yeah and people are like yeah that's cool you know when you're working with somebody who's making that work with you they're you know fully engaged and they're like yeah this works and they're like whoa what if we kind of twisted it and did this instead and um, I just find that I'm, I'm really enjoying it, which is why I've been doing, I feel like a lot of it lately. Cause it's, um, it's just, uh, really rewarding to have somebody who's, um, you know, emotionally and, uh, kind of invested in the work. I think that's the most important thing, I suppose, that you're enjoying it and that you're like having that kind of correspondence in work, I think is, um, it's always really interesting as a viewer when you can see something that has been shaped by more than one person as well. And you can see maybe both, both voices through that performance or through that artwork. Um, we just have a question in the chat um, saying, as you move forward in your practice, do you find that you plan more in advance the visual impact and result of your print work? How you think a work may be finalized like the void piece ultimately becoming a large multi-piece circle embodying the process of creation. Are there some limitations to this, like removing the chance factor? So I guess, how much do you feel like you plan ahead and how much are you willing to kind of, especially within the print process, kind of leave it to chance? Yeah, I love that question. Um, so um, I, there, Hmm. there's different I feel like different artists have different ways of working and I've met a number of artists who really like to have everything really planned out in terms of you know there's a lot of research that's done into the work and um I do that to an extent you know um I try to do usually a lot of my research is around sort of trial and error to make sure the materials and the mediums are going to generally behave the way I want them to um but with performance, and I feel like it's the same way with printmaking, is there is this moment where you're 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 pulling the print or you're you're going on stage and there is always going to be an unknown factor. You know, you could have done everything right when you're pulling a print, but for whatever reason the humidity isn't quite right that day and it's going to look very different from what you expected. So there's always going to be that kind of chance factor with printmaking. And it's the same with performance, you know. You might have a bit in a performance piece that's intended to be funny, but the audience is not there and it, it, the joke does not land at all. <laughs> and there's just this sort of like weird, awkward silence, um, you know, and you, you kind of have to pivot to sort of start to feed off of how people are interpreting that work. Um, so I think I personally like to work with that chance factor, I guess. Um, I, I sort of plan with it I sort of plan around it um, constantly. Um, I don't, I don't know what the threshold is, but I have a certain point where I'm like, okay, I can't research this anymore. I can't plan this anymore. I have to make it, and if it flops, it flops. If it, uh, you know, if it if it doesn't work the way I think it's going to work, then it, and then that's just going to be the piece, or I'm just never going to, it's never going to see the light of day. Um, so I, I really like working with that with that chance factor. And that makes sense. I've forgotten how many times I've seen somebody in like the kitchen at the studio and asked them how their day is going. And they're like, not as I thought it would. <laughs> um, and I guess just as a final question, just to draw between print and performance again, um, it's interesting that you have the chance factor in both, that you have a sort of, there's a sort of physicality to making print as well. Um, but is there anything else that you've found working in both mediums for quite a long time at this point that that really kind of you can see as a connection between the two? Um, well, I, hmm. I mean, there, I think there's some kind of like obvious ones, right? Where I think um, when I, when I, when I try to look up articles and other people who are thinking about print through performance, they're really thinking about that process behind printmaking, you know, and um, you know, everybody, when you know I just remember sort of uh having kind of discussions with people about print in the past and being like yeah it's all about the process and I was like yeah I know what you mean process you know and like printmaking is such a like 
step one, step two, step three, step four in order to get the thing or you will not get the thing if you do not follow the steps, um, almost exactly how they're laid out. Um, I think uh, performance, um, you know, depending on how you kind of go about it, you can have these moments where you have these scores or you sort of have these sort of strict um, sort of set of rules that you're, you're following, right? Um, uh, <clears throat> I, I think that's kind of one way to think about it um, as I'm kind of working tangentially. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm going to have to think about that one. I did have one person DM me a question and I, I do want to answer that if that's okay. So um, they asked, um, do you have any advice for new artists trying to enter the performance art scene and art scene in general? Um, so I don't, the performance art scene, I don't know much about that. <laughs> Just be honest. I actually, um, I'm very new to uh, Toronto. I've only lived here about 18 months, and um, I only recently learned of there's a particular performance art center, and I'm forgetting the name. Um, so I just recently learned about that one, and I'm planning on checking them out and seeing what they're doing. Um, I would say if you're trying to get into performance art, I would really recommend. Um, I, I mean, I I started with a lot of the Fluxus um, works, and there's some. Um, uh, there's a book, I don't think it's called, the, it might be called the Flexus Handbook or something along those lines where they actually list like all of these different scores. Um, and I think it's fun to just maybe read through those or and imagine or actually physically try acting out some of those scores and seeing how your body sort of responds to it. But I think a lot of people come into performance art from different, from different backgrounds, um, whether it's visual arts or even um, theater or dance or other um, forms of bodily movement. Um, and as for kind of getting into the art scene in general, um, I think that's um, that's always that's always a great question. And I think it really kind of depends on where you are um, and sort of what what your particular goals are. I think um, I know when I first finished grad school, I kind of had this idea of like, I'm going to apply to all these like tier one residencies and galleries to try to get into. And um, I had an entire year of rejection letters, which was an amazingly humbling. Um, it was a great experience for me because it forced me to start to think about what are other ways that I could get my work out there because I'm, I'm not, the work that I'm making isn't, you know, jiving with these other institutions that at the time I viewed as being the ones that I really wanted to work with. And so um, I think work small and work local and start thinking about, you know, institutions that are closer to where you are that are maybe like smaller or, um, you know, their mandate is specifically working with emerging artists um, or working with artists who don't have a long career exhibition and trying to find ways to um, get involved with them. Um, so nonprofits are great for that, <laughs> like Open Studio, but um, <laughs> Yeah, that's all really good advice. And um, we'll be sharing some links at the end too. Um, if anyone's interested in print, we actually have our residencies up for um, submission at the moment. So we'll share some links towards the end about that. But um, yeah, great advice there. Thank you. Um, just one more question um, uh, in the chat. Uh, do you see your print and performance pieces as somatic experiences? If so, does this mind-body connection influence whether you archive the work, exhibit it or destroy it? Um, I feel silly. I'm going to have to ask, what does somatic mean in this context? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the question was from um, from Anna. I'm Anya. Sorry. Anya, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Just okay. relating to the body. Um, yeah. Um, I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess it would, right? Um, so especially with um, the, the one that, uh, you know, that one vicious cycle with punching the plate, you know, I kind of talked about it's, a, it's an internal struggle, struggle made physical, made visible. Um, so that one, that one really is very much a connection to thinking about mind body and especially when doing a lot of this research into trauma, thinking about how um, trauma is a really great example of how something that has an emotional impact actually um, has a physical impact on the body. Um, and so I think performance really became a natural vehicle for me to explore that because it's a way of expressing physically things that exist outside of language. And that's, I think that's what art is, period, right? Art is about creating a new sort of language, whether that's visual or performative or auditory. 
um, <clears throat> um, or some other sensory that I'm missing, um, taste, <laughs> right? Or where, you know, you're kind of like trying to uh, tell um, either a narrative or an emotional experience that um, is better described through that sensory experience as opposed to through verbal language um, or through written language. Um, and so, you know, some of these works are very difficult to talk about because they're not meant to be talked about. They're not meant to be written. There's not meant to be an artist statement about it. They're, it's supposed to be, this is the work and this is how it's presented. I'll provide a little bit of context for you, but the emotional experience, the, the I guess the somatic experience that's happening is like, um, is what you're picking up on. And I'm not gonna force your hand to interpret it the way I want you to interpret it. You're, you're gonna come at it with your own um, sort of um, experiences. Um, and now how does that influence whether archive, exhibit or destroy it? Um, I haven't, um, I guess I do try to archive all of my work. I'm really bad about, um, I hate selling my work. <laughs> so I kind of been lugging it across the continent <laughs> for several years now. Um, I'm, I, I like being able to kind of look back on it and see like what I was doing and kind of like get to know past versions of myself again um, and sort of respond to that. Um, I think if the work gets destroyed, um, I don't know. I don't think I, I can't say, I don't, I don't think I've really ever intentionally destroyed stuff. I always look at material and I'm like, if it didn't work out the way I wanted it to work out, I try to rehabilitate it in some way. So like, for instance, if I had a, an edition of prints that like went terribly, I'm, I will either print them or, uh, or I'm sorry, paint on top of them or print new things on them or pair them into little scraps of paper that I then write notes on or something like that. Um, so uh, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I think so, Thank, thanks so much. Um, I think we'll just round it up there. Um, thanks so much to, um, to Kit for to sharing your work, um, sharing the ideas behind it. Um, and to everyone for joining today, thanks so much for taking some time out of your afternoon to, um, to hear the talk. Um, our current exhibitions um, by Alex Linfield, Phoebe Todd Parish, and Chris Hutzel actually close this Saturday at 5 p.m. So if you're um, able to, please come down and check the shows out before they close. Um, our next exhibitions are going to be by Francisco Fernando Granados, Mohamed Tabesh, and Panya Clark Espinal, and they open on Friday, June 9th. Uh, we'd love to see you there. If you're able to come and join us, the opening will be from 5 till 7 p.m. Um, and our next Print Speak session will actually feature Francisco Fernando Granados, who's showing in our main gallery, and he'll be in conversation with Gordon Trick and Leslie Finlayson. Uh, that's on July 6th, so stay tuned for registration um, links for that. Um, our current calls for artist residencies, as I mentioned, are currently open. Um, there's some links in the chat there just to... Um, to link back to everything and the info can be found on our website. Just contact us if you have any questions about it. And again, just thank you one more time, Kit, thanks so much for speaking so eloquently and candidly about your work and your practice um, and sharing those really interesting intersections between print and performance. And I think it's been a really inspiring kind of talk for, um, for me personally, but I'm sure for everyone in the conversation too. Um, thanks everybody. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Um, we'll be recording this, so we will post it on YouTube once we've got our captions sorted. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.